Hello everyone. So, let us continue our discussion on uh, Hamilton's principle and Lagrange equation. So, if we uh, recall in the previous lecture, we defined Hamilton's principle. And then uh, we defined physical space then configuration space and uh, we also defined generalized coordinate right. Now, uh, this generalized coordinate normally uh, we denote it by q k and then we also uh, define degrees of freedom. And then we also solve uh, one problem using principle of virtual work. Now, why we do all this? The reason is uh, earlier uh, when we solved single degree of freedom system, then we used uh, mostly the equilibrium equations following Newton's law or uh, D. Lambert's principle. Then from the ABD diagram, then we developed the equation of motion and that we solved for different excitations. Now, our aim is to develop uh, uh, other mathematical tools so that if you have a complex structure, then for that we can develop the equation of motion because that is the starting point. Once we have the equation of motion, then we can solve it and find out the response quantity. Now, um, before we discuss further on Hamilton's principle and particularly Lagrange equation, let us first see if we have a system where energy is conserved. So, uh, let us quickly revisit principle. of conservation of energy. For that, let us consider the same example of mass spring dashpot system and for the time being because we are considering a case where energy is conserved. So, we will take this two element only, although we know there is a damping in the system and for that we have only 1 degrees of freedom. So, for this system what will be the kinetic energy? We can easily write it is half times mass of the system that is small m and then it deforms by amount of x of t. So, the velocity in this case is uh, x dot, so half m x dot square. So, that is the kinetic energy. Now, the moment it will try to deform, obviously this spring will experience some extension or compression depending upon the nature of this x t. So, the potential energy in this case is half then um, k x square, right. How do we get this? It is actually uh, we need to integrate uh, 0 to x, then we have to consider a dummy variable. So, k uh, and then uh, y is the force and then 
d y is the deformation. So, this is the potential energy or because of the deformation this will be the amount of energy stored in this uh, spring. Now, we have total energy of the system total energy which is equal to summation of the kinetic energy and potential energy. So, let this be total energy is say E. Now, as per this principle total energy is conserved that means, if I differentiate this quantity with respect to time, what I will get because this total energy is constant I will get this quantity to be 0. So, if I complete the exercise, so what I have first derivative with respect to time and E is the total energy for that we have half m x dot square plus half k x square. This is equal to 0. Now, then we perform this first derivative with respect to t. So, what will happen? So, half times m then 2 x dot x double dot plus half k 2 x and then x dot this is equal to 0. Then obviously, if we simplify this expression what we will have m x double dot plus k x times x dot is equal to 0. Now, obviously, if this condition is satisfied the right hand side is 0, then we have m x double dot plus k x is equal to 0, because x dot is not equal to 0 for all t. Then what we get? We get again the equation of motion. This is the same equation of motion we derived using d l Lambert's principle. right? And then from this equation what we get again? x double dot plus omega n square times x is equal to 0. So, omega n square is equal to k by m. So, what you can see from this discussion is that if we deal with a conservative system and uh, we do not consider any energy dissipation, then using this principle of conservation of energy we can derive the equation of motion and we can also find out the natural frequency. So, this is a free vibration equation. Of course, there will be initial conditions that I am not writing here, but what is the point to be noted here is that we can identify what is the natural frequency. Remember, we have already discussed in detail what is the response spectrum approach, then if we know the natural frequency of the system, then we can easily quantify the peak response for a given earthquake and the specified damping level. And that is the input for the design. So, the designer wants uh, these uh, information, because for their design purpose this is enough. And in fact, for uh, any structure, whenever we deal with structural dynamics, the first parameter that uh, we are always worried of is the natural frequency of the structure. For that, we can adapt this principle of conservation of energy to develop the free vibration equation. And if we 
say consider now if we consider say uh, let the displacement for the same SDOF system B x of t is equal to c sin omega n t plus say theta. Then obviously, what will be my x dot of t? This will be c omega n cos omega n t plus theta. Now, what will be the amplitude of this displacement? This is c. What will be the amplitude of x dot of t? This is c omega n. Now, if you look at the expression of kinetic energy, this is half m x dot square. Now, if we find out what is the maximum value of kinetic energy, so this will be half m. In place of x dot, we have to consider the maximum value of x dot. So that is c omega n whole square. Also, the potential energy is half k x square. Similarly, if we find out what is the maximum value of potential energy, so this will be half k and the maximum value of x is uh, c, so this will be c square. Now, if we have a system where is, there is no energy dissipation and actually the kinetic energy is converted to potential energy and vice versa. If you recall the example of a pendulum, so what we do, we allow uh, the bob initially to have a displacement and then release it, so automatically it swings about its uh, equilibrium position. So, then what happens? We balance these two, so T max will be equal to what? V max. Now, if you do that, then what we get is half m c omega n whole square is equal to half k c square. And then ultimately what you get is omega n square is again equal to k by n. So, this is again another approach to find out the natural frequency of the system. So, natural frequency and in this approach you see what we do, we first assume the deformed shape that is x of t and using this information we quantify the kinetic energy and potential energy and then we maximize those two quantities and then equating them, we find out basically the natural frequency and this method is called Rayleigh's method. So, what Rayleigh's method says that you start with a assumed displacement field for the structure and you quantify the maximum value of kinetic energy and potential energy and then balance them, uh, equate them and then find, any, find out the natural frequency of the system. And this is really very useful. So, if you have a structure and then for that if we want to find out what is the natural frequency very quickly, then uh, we can start with the assumed shape and then we can easily find out the natural frequency. So, we will solve one example. So, 
let let us have a cantilever beam and then this beam has m bar as mass per unit length. So, we define the physical space and the length of the beam is L and flexural rigidity is E i. Then, if I draw the center line of the beam, it is going to deform like this. And the deformation at the free end is delta. What is our task? We will adopt Raleigh's approach. So, and then using this approach, our task is to find out the natural frequency of the system. Now, for that, um, what effectively we do? We actually convert this into a equivalent single degree of freedom system. So, the beam uh, deforms in the vertical direction. So, we have uh, a spring and then the mass of the beam is acting downward. So, this is effectively the system that we are going to find out. So, we will find out k and obviously, we can easily quantify m and then using these two information, we can uh, find out the natural frequency and for that what we do? Let us assume the deformation y which is a function of x and t is equal to phi of x and then y of t. So, this phi of x we call it because it defines the shape we call it shape function. Now, what will be the value of shape function at the free end? Obviously, that will be 1. So, let us assume phi of x. So, that is the starting point of Raleigh's approach. So, phi of x will be equal to what? Let us assume some shape. So, this is say 3 by L square, and then within bracket L x by 2 minus x square by 6. So, you can ask me where from we get this expression? What we know from our static analysis how the beam deforms because this is a cantilever beam obviously, at the fixed, fixed end there will be no deformation and it will deform maximum at the free end and we know the nature of this. So, it is a quadratic uh, polynomial that defines the deformed shape and if you look at this expression, if we find out what is phi of x at x equal to L. So, what we have 3 by L square and then inside we will have L square by 2 minus L square by 6. So, effectively what we have 3 then 6 and then 3 minus 1. So, effectively we will get 1. So, that is the deformed shape we assume. So, if we differentiate this y, what we will get is y dot x comma t 
is equal to phi of x then y dot of t. Okay. Now, what will be y of t? Let us assume again this is following the same uh, expression uh, what we have here. So, it is c times sin omega n t plus theta. So, what is the amplitude? It is c. Now, obviously, c will be equal to what? c is equal to if we apply say a force f. So, it will be f l cube divided by 3 e i. So, if we apply a force at the free end, then we can uh, estimate c. So, we use that information here to define um, y, com y within bracket x comma t. So, we have defined the shape function and then y of t. Now, the question is if we quantify what is the kinetic energy, what we will get half and in this case we have to consider a differential element at a distance x. So, mass of that element m bar times dx. So, that is the total mass half mass times deform uh, velocity y dot x comma t square and then we have to integrate this quantity from 0 to L. Now, obviously, we can carry out this task. So, this will be half m bar then in place of y dot x comma t. So, what we can do we have phi square x and then we have the maximum value of um, this kinetic energy. Obviously, what will be the maximum value? It is c omega n whole square then dx. Okay. So, now what we will do? We will put the expression of this phi of x. So, what we have is half m bar. So, what is phi? This is 3 by L square. Then we have um, L x by 2 minus x square by 6 square of this quantity. Then C omega n whole square dx and then finally, we can carry out this integration. I leave this as a home task. If you do that, you will get 17 m bar then c square omega n square divided by 8. Please check this expression. You can easily carry out this task so that I leave it for you. And then uh, our next, next task is to find out what is the potential energy or maximum value of the potential energy and then uh, what we will do, we will equate them. So, let me create some space. So, So, the potential energy in this case V and maximum value of that is half and then mm, the effective force at the free end and then uh, it is uh, maximum value of the deformation. So, we have C there. So, 
that is the expression and then uh, we already know that uh, delta is equal to c is equal to f l cube divided by 3 i right that comes from our static analysis all of you know from your undergrad structural analysis. So, in place of f what we can put is 3 e i and then it will be c square divided by l cube. So, we have the maximum value of potential energy and kinetic energy obviously our next task is to equate these two. So, what we have T m is equal to V m and if we do that what we have here is 17 then m bar then c square omega n square divided by 80 that is the left hand side and then that we equate it to half times 3 e i c square then l cube. So, finally, what we get obviously we can cancel this c square c square and then we can also uh, reduce this denominator and then what we have is omega n square is equal to 1 20 e i divided by 17 m bar l cube. So, that is the expression we get using Rayleigh's method and we can obviously find out what is natural frequency. So, you can see using this approach we can easily develop what is the natural frequency or the first natural frequency of the system just by equating maximum value of kinetic energy and potential energy. But there is a catch we have to start with a deformed shape. So, we use this expression and also this expression. Obviously, if our assumption for this uh, deformed shape is very accurate then our estimation will also have less error it will be accurate or otherwise this estimation of natural frequency will have some amount of error. But if we have a good guess of this deformed shape and then we can easily approach this technique and then using this technique we can solve the natural frequency of the system. It is very handy for uh, some of the structures for example, in this case we have a cantilever beam or if you have a say simply supported beam or similar structures where we know the expected deformed shape from our static analysis then we can easily equate that uh, and use that actually to find out kinetic and potential energy that will help us to quantify the natural frequency of the system. Designers very often uh, use this technique to find out natural frequency and then from there they can easily sense what should be the maximum value of the deformation from the response spectrum analysis. So, that is the Rayleigh's method again this is another approach to quantify the natural um, frequency which in a way quantifies the structural uh, dynamic behavior. Now, with that background let us go back to our uh, definition of Hamilton's principle. Okay. Now, if you recall first we defined L and this is what we call Lagrangian which is T minus V. So, this is our uh, 
Lagrangian. Now, once we define Lagrangian, then uh, we define what we call action integral. So, that is say i. So, it will be t 1 to t 2 Lagrangian, which is again a function of q k, q k dot and t. If you integrate that, between t 1 to t 2 what we get is action integral. Now, what Hamilton's principle says delta i which is equal to delta of t 1 to t 2 l d t this will be equal to 0. And we also define a term stationary because our main objective is what? To find out q k t, right. So, this is the response in generalized coordinate, but this response will actually optimize this uh, action integral actually. So, this one and that is how uh, we actually get this uh, expression first variation of i is equal to 0. So, before we proceed further, we have to first define what we mean by first variation and uh, how can we actually solve this uh, expression and once we solve this expression, what is the outcome of that. So, let us first investigate and for that we have to um, first define some basic theories of uh, variational principle. So, that we will do first and then we will come back to this again. So, our next task is calculus of variation. Again, uh, we will define up to that much what we need to solve that uh, expression we get from the definition of the Hamilton's principle. Now, for that again, uh, let us let us consider a uh, functional which is say f of y y prime x. Now, you can easily correlate this we have defined Lagrangian and in that case uh, what is y that is q k generalized coordinate. Then what is y prime that is q k dot and what is x in that case it is t. So, if we have this functional and if we define the action integral obviously, we have to differentiate between x 1 to x 2 this f which is a function of y, y prime and x right. Now, in this format, you just note that x is the independent variable and what is our objective? Our objective is to find Uh, a function y of x that 
optimizes the integral. Again, if you correlate that with the uh, Hamilton's principle, if you recall one diagram uh, we used where the system starts from T1 and goes to T2 and then our main uh, problem was to find out which path the system will follow when it will have a excursion from T1 to T2. The same statement here uh, we make. So, our objective is basically to solve this optimization problem. Now, uh, here we have a functional, but if I uh, give you the optimization for a function, so if you recall, optimization of a function f of x. It is very simple. What is the task? Our objective is to find out the value of x that is x star for which f x is uh, either maximum or minimum, right. Now, for that what we do, you can easily tell we differentiate this function and then uh, at x star uh, this is equal to 0. So, basically we differentiate this function and then uh, we equate it to 0 and then uh, the solution of this actually gives us x star. And once that is done, uh, we also check this quantity and depending upon the value of this second derivative, whether it is positive or negative, then we define what is the maximum point or the minimum point. Now, how do we do that? It is very simple what we do is uh, we apply a small variation say epsilon um, over x. So, what we have f x plus epsilon, right. And that we can expand it in Taylor series. So, if we do that, so it will be a infinite series. So, first term will be f x, then next term will be epsilon um, d of f d x plus half, then epsilon square d 2 f d x 2 plus it will continue. Normally what we do, we truncate this series. So, uh, what we do is uh, we consider up to certain terms. So, this will be approximately equal and uh, we have say uh, error from cubic term onward. So, that is the amount of error. Now, if we rearrange this term, so what we have is this quantity, right. And, uh, this term on the left hand side what we call is delta of f. Now, for stationary uh, point x star, so 
for stationary point x star. So, what we have is d f d x at x star is equal to 0. So, in that case uh, at stationary point, so our d f will be what will be half epsilon square d 2 f d x 2 and then uh, this is at the point x star. Now, obviously, this quantity will uh, tell us whether we will get maxima or minima, but for this function the problem is very simple because our task is to find out this uh, x star. Now, what we are going to do? We are going to adopt the same logic here, but in this case we have a functional. So, we have to be very careful when we adopt this same logic here. Nevertheless, the approach will be all the same. So, what we will do? We will expand this functional and uh, then the moment we expand this functional, we actually will find out this variation and then uh, once we uh, use that variation and find out the stationary point, it will not be a point actually, it will be a stationary conditions for which we will get the function as the optimal solution. That we will do in a minute, but before we do that, let us just quickly uh, extend this Taylor series for multi dimension. So, if you have say a function f x 1, x 2 up to x n and then what we will then do is we apply uh, variation epsilon 1 over x 2 it will be epsilon 2 and then x n it will be epsilon n. Then uh, if we expand that, what will the first term? It is f x 1, x 2, x n, then plus we will have uh, summation i equal to 1 to n epsilon i and then we have um, first differential of f with respect to x i. Then plus we will have summation i j equal to 1 to n half then we have epsilon i epsilon j and then we will have second derivative with respect to x i x j. So, if you can recall this simply simple expression, we can easily extend it for this uh, functional. So, that is our next task. So, what we will do? Uh, we will now uh, work on this functional form. So, what we have here? We have the action integral and that action integral is say i of y is equal to x 1 to x 2, then f y y prime x d x, right. Now, note this action integral i of y is linear if i of 
alpha y is equal to alpha times i y. What is alpha? It is a scalar multiplier. Then if we have i of x plus y, this is equal to i of x plus i of y. Similarly, if we have say b of x comma y is bilinear if b of x plus y comma z is equal to b of x comma z plus b of y comma z. Similarly, if we have b of x comma y plus z, it will be b of x comma y plus b of x comma z. Again, if we have say b of alpha x comma y, this will be equal to alpha times b of x comma y. Similarly, b of x comma alpha y will be what? Alpha times b of x comma y. So, the these are the linear properties of this action integral. Now, uh, graphically what we mean? So, this is the x axis and this is the y. So, we have two instants. So, say this is x 1 equal to a, x 2 equal to b and we start from this point capital A and we actually move to B. The question is which path we are going to follow. So, there are infinite possibilities out of that again our task is to find out the path that we are going to follow and for that what we do? Just like in case of function, we applied a small variation over x. Here, what we will do? We will again we apply a small variation. So, what we do? Our objective is to find out y of x. So, we apply a small variation just like we did in case of function. So, we consider this uh, big variation. So, consider this weak variation. Why weak variation? Of course, there are other type of variations, there are strong variations, but for the time being let us consider this uh, weak variation. Then, uh, then if you look at what is y of x at the boundary. So, if you look at this blue line at A, what will be the value of this uh, uh, small variation? It is 0. Similarly, at B, we have uh, 0 value. So, this function will be 0 at the boundary. 
then if we effectively apply a uh, fast variation of i what will be this quantity this quantity will be i of y of x plus this weak variation minus i of y of x. So, if I write down in terms of integral, so this will be a to b or x 1 to x 2, we have a f y plus the variation then it will be y prime plus epsilon which is a multiplier and then we have x. So, this is the first integral then minus a to b the functional y y prime x dx. Okay. So, you can easily sense what will be the next step we have to consider this expression and we will expand it in Taylor series. So, that is the next task. So, if we do that what we have is a f y plus the weak variation comma y prime plus corresponding weak variation x. So, this we are going to expand it in Taylor series. So, first term will be a f y y prime x then plus epsilon will have the first derivative that we can easily do and then the quadratic term will be half epsilon square and then within bracket and then finally, there will be the error term. Okay. So, what we have here is basically the expression of this functional when we expand it in Taylor series. Now, obviously, using this expression then we can uh, write down the first variation over the action integral. So, this will be what we can easily write down now. So, if we use this expression in the previous expression, so here, so what we will get is a to b, this epsilon will come out of the integral. So, we have epsilon then then the second term will be half epsilon square that will come out of the integral. So, this will be a to b and then we have uh, within bracket
So, this expression is very simple to derive. So, what we can do? We just write down the first integral as say i 1 of y and then the second integral as i 2 of y plus we will have error term. So, it is very straightforward and for stationarity, so you have stationary conditions that means, now we are looking for the optimal solution. So, stationary condition yields i of 1 of y is equal to 0. So, that is the stationary condition. Obviously, the second integral will dictate whether this solution from the first condition will offer us maximum or minimum. Okay. So, now if we focus on this condition and see how it goes, what we have is i 1 of y is equal to 0. And if you look at the expression, we have epsilon integral a to b, then within bracket we have the expression that we have just derived. Right. So, if we open the bracket, obviously what we have a to b, then the first term partial differential of f with respect to y dx plus integral a to b the second term and this is equal to 0. If you notice all these comes from the elementary calculus that we have covered in our uh, plus 2 level. Now, if you look at this second term, we can further uh, simplify this expression, we can actually perform this integral. So, what we do first term will remain as is. So, this is partial differential and then for the second term, we consider one of them. See, there are two expressions in product form. So, we can consider one as first function, another as second function and if we integrate, so what we will have So, we consider this as first function and then what we have is uh, this expression, right. Okay. Now, if we notice the second term here, we can conclude that this weak variation is evaluated at the boundary A and B. So, if you recall, what is the property of the weak variation? Weak variation is eta A is equal to eta B is equal to 0. If that is the case, obviously, this quantity will lead to 0 because that is the property of weak variation. So, we are left with the remaining two term. So, we have a to b, then the first term minus the second term.
right. And in fact, we can further simplify this. So, what we can do if we bring them under a single integral. So, what we have is a to b then eta of x and then within bracket we have and then minus d dx ok. So, you are almost there. So, we started with this action integral that we get equating first variation to 0 and then now we have this quantity here. Out of that what we have already noticed that this weak variation at the boundary is 0 obviously weak variation will not be 0 between A and B. So, when we consider the, this integration between A and B obviously this quantity cannot be 0. So, we are left with So, this is the condition that will give us the stationary condition and this equation is called Euler's equation. Actually, first Euler equations. Sometimes in some reference you will see this is called characteristics equation. So, So, for the optimal condition when we have the stationary condition uh, that we get from the first variation equal to 0, we get this uh, Euler's equation. So, when we will actually apply this theory on Hamilton's principle, we will see what we get uh, this equation for our dynamical system. But for the time being you see we start with the concept of variation, then we define weak variation and we also define the action integral and the moment we optimize that action integral the first condition we get is the first Euler's equation. Now, we can continue further. So, let us complete the exercise and then we will uh, see how we can extend this calculus of variation for uh, the expression we derived from the definition of Hamilton's principle. So, now uh, let us consider let us consider first differential of f y comma y prime comma x. So, we consider this functional and then we find out d f d x. So, this functional is uh, having actually three term within this first bracket you have y, y prime and x. So, if we differentiate obviously, what will happen? We will apply chain rule. It is as simple as it is. So, dou f dou y then we have dy dx plus dou f y prime then dy prime dx and then finally, we have dou f dou x. So, what is this quantity? We can uh, modify this expression. So, we have in place of dy dx we can write y prime. Similarly, uh, in this case we have y double prime. Right. Now, again 
if we consider the second term so what we have we have d dx of y prime so y prime let us consider this and then we will find out what is the expression for this second term in a minute so what we have here again we will apply chain rule so we have y double prime then do f do then plus y prime then d dx of y prime then uh, what we have is the expression of this second term which is equal to d dx of y prime right now if we use this expression then what we have so therefore df dx will be equal to the first term will remain as is so what we have here the first term we have y prime then do f do y in place of this second term we can now modify that so we have d dx then y prime do f do y prime minus y prime and then d dx of do f do y prime and then the last term that is do f do x. Again it is pretty straightforward. So, what we have here is this quantity and then minus if we take this term on the left hand side. So, what we have d dx then y prime is equal to y prime do f do y minus y prime d dx do f do y prime plus do f do x ok. So, the left hand side is what you get is d dx of f minus y prime do f do y prime is equal to what is equal to uh, we have do f do x plus we can take y prime common. So, what we have do f do y minus d d x of do f do y prime. Now, if you look at this expression and uh, you can easily identify what we have on the right hand side is uh, this quantity. is what this is we have already identified here. So, this is equal to 0 because it is the Euler's first equation. Now, if that is the case obviously, we can remove this quantity because that is already 0 we are left with this expression. Now, now 
Now, if there is no explicit dependence of f on x, then what will happen? This will lead to this quantity equal to 0. So, under that situation, what we can conclude is that we have d dx of f minus y prime d f d y prime is equal to 0. It implies that this third bracketed term f minus y prime dou f dou y prime is equal to constant. And this expression is called Euler's equation, but this is second Euler's equation. So, what we get? We started with the first variation of the action integral, we equate it to 0 and then immediately we get actually two expressions. The first one is uh, the Euler's equation. So, that is So, this is the first equation and then now we have another condition. So, this is the second equation. Both of them are extremely important because they will actually help us to identify the stationary condition and the moment we do that, what will be the output of that? It is y of x. Recall y of x and uh, that will optimize the action integral. And for optima again, uh, we have to go to the second variation because if you recall the function f x when we optimized, first derivative we equate it to 0 and we find out what is the value of x star and then we look at the second derivative that tells us whether we get maxima or minima. Here in this case also, after this we have to consider the second variation, but we will not go into the details of those uh, expressions for second variation. For the time being, we will use this concept of variational calculus and then uh, in the next class, what we will do, we will uh, find out the expression when we apply first variation over the action integral as per Hamilton's principle. So, that we will do in the next class. So, today's derivation is extremely important a new concept of calculus of variation. But again, if you follow all the steps, they are pretty simple because all these mathematical operations is uh, what we already learned at plus 2 level and using that calculus, we actually derived the first variation of a functional and then we get two important equations. One is basically Euler's first equation and then Euler's second equation you can actually show that under uh, certain conditions, this uh, second uh, equation uh, leads to um, conservation of conservation laws in physical systems that we can actually show. So, what we will do in the next class, again I repeat, uh, we will consider Hamilton's principle, the definition which is already known to us, then we will apply this concept of variation and we will see what we can derive from that expression. With that, let us close here. Thank you very much. We will continue in the next class.